God, I, I wish that those words were true for me most of the time. That I just want you, that I just want to sit at your feet, but God, I, so often I want so many other things. God, sometimes things that really, really matter and oftentimes things that really don't. God, I know that my desires, that our desires can be all over the map. And God, I love that we can sing songs like this that are, that are aspirational or even maybe true for us in a moment. But God, my, my prayer for us this morning is that these words could become more true in our lives. God, that we'd find ourselves longing more regularly to be in your presence, God, and that when, when we find ourselves there, we would taste and smell and see and know how good it really is and that we'd want to stay there a while. And so, God, I just pray that you would move us closer to that. We invite you to change us to shift our desires to transform the way we think and feel and act we pray this in your name jesus amen amen see you later youth didn't want to share anything with you anyways but i do have a really juicy confession to make this morning i wait till they're out the door So I've got this confession I, I have to make this morning, and it's this. It's that I often drive in the slow lane on purpose. I know you guys are thinking, like, what is wrong with you? I, I don't know why I do it sometimes. Actually, pretty often, I, on the freeway, I, I move over to the right-hand lane, and I drive there, Sometimes without even knowing why. One time, I was driving down the freeway, just minding my own business, deep in thought, and I felt like someone was staring at me. And so I looked out my left window, and it was my good friend Cody, driving right next to me, staring at me, with this look of disgust <laughs> and concern on his face. Mouthing words at me I couldn't quite understand, but I could only imagine what they were. And before I knew it, he sped off into the distance, and immediately my phone began to ring. And it was Cody. And he was genuinely concerned for me. He's like, dude, I thought that was you, and then I pulled up next to you, and I figured out it was you, and I'm worried, man. Are you feeling okay? Is your car running okay? Why are you driving in the slow lane? And to be honest, I had never really thought about it. And I didn't have a really great answer for him. And you might be here this morning and be like, dude, what's with the random confession? Um, if you know me, that might not be surprising at all. But if you don't know me, welcome. My name's Derek. Um, I, I have the privilege of serving here as our lead pastor. And I often drive in the slow lane. Uh, if you're joining us for the, for the first time... Um, you're joining us in the middle of a series that we've been in now for several weeks called The Sacred Ordinary. And what we're trying to do is, is talk about these day-to-day -day ordinary instances that, that can connect us somehow profoundly with God in ways that we often miss. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about losing your keys and made the connection that somehow it connects to us wanting to practice this spiritual discipline called confession. So I figured I'd give it a try this morning. I'd just confess something uh, to start the morning off with, but I realized if I would just lose my keys more often, I would never have to drive in the slow lane. And, I, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. So this, this series um, has been really inspired by this book by Tish Harrison Warren called The Liturgy of the Ordinary. I couldn't recommend it any more highly. Um, and so we, we were so moved by, by the rhythms and the conversations in this book that we decided to plan a sermon series around it. And we chose this book and this series and this conversation to have because as a church, our mission is to make on earth as it is in heaven. 
And we do this by developing and commissioning followers of Jesus to love God and to love others. And one of the things we're really convinced of is that in order to love God really well and to love others really well, that there's this this invitation that God has given us to practice these rhythms of spiritual disciplines. And these things require practice. They they don't have to be overwhelming. They don't have to be out of reach. They don't have to be threatening or daunting. It's this idea that, that in the overlooked moments of our lives, the routines of our day, that there's opportunities in there for these things to become surprising ways that connect us to God. And so the the premise of this series, the premise of this conversation is how can ordinary things, can we find the sacred in those? And how in sacred things can we see the ordinary and realize that these two things are not adamantly opposed or disconnected, but that they're integrated and that they overlap and that they help us understand how we can become closer to God. So, so each week we've been looking at these mundane things we do, like waking up and making the bed. And, and that was connected to us understanding the, our belovedness, the way that God cherishes and loves every single one of us. The next week we talked about brushing our teeth and, and how that somehow helps us understand how to worship fully with our spirit and our bodies, that our bodies are a gift, that we can worship God fully uh, in the wholeness of our being. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about losing your keys and how that can move us into a place of confession with first ourselves and then with God and with each other. And these are things that, that, that we do regularly, mundane activities that, that can springboard us into a spiritual practice, can connect us more deeply with, with God. And what I want to talk about today is sitting in traffic. Now, I know we don't live in L.A. We used to live in L.A., and man, this was, a, this was a real lived experience for us. How many of you in San Diego sit in traffic for any amount of time? Just give me a, a shout. I can't really see you. Enough, right? Like, there's enough. We have real rush hour in San Diego, right? Like, it's just an hour, not all day, like L.A., but we, we, we sometimes we, we find ourselves sitting in traffic, or, or maybe if that's not you, if you don't commute, like... Honestly, I work, my, I work as a firefighter, and my house and my fire station are close enough that I don't really have to get on a freeway. So like this, this sitting in traffic thing, former life of mine, not something I currently deal with, but we all know what it's like to wait. Right? We, 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 we're all waiting on something. Waiting is, is this infuriating experience that most of us have. In fact, I work in Little Italy. And when we drive around for different calls at night, I'm amazed at how many people wait in line for salt and straw or for a restaurant or for a bar. Well, I know salt and straw, you're like, I'll wait for that. I'll wait for that. And honestly, though, when we think about waiting, usually our attitude is like, ain't nobody got time for that. Like, no one has time to wait. And what I want to talk about this morning, sitting in traffic, I want this sitting in traffic metaphor to, to become this invitation that would move us out of waiting, being this frustrating experience, and having it somehow move it into becoming a fulfilling experience. I know that sounds lofty. Or how about moving from it being miserable to becoming spiritual? Waiting is an unavoidable part of life. We wait for big things and we wait for small things. We, we wait for the coffee to brew. Um, we wait for the doctor to call. We wait for school to end, if you're my son, Blake. School just took forever today to end. We wait for retirement. We wait for that return text. The bubbles are the worst. Could you imagine if email had that? We wait... To get pregnant, we wait to have the baby, we wait for those kids to grow up and get out of the house. We wait for difficult things and we wait for hopeful things. But waiting is something we all do. And as Christians, one of the most important callings we have is to wait 
until the Lord himself returns. And and sadly, with all of the practice we have at waiting, we mostly suck at it. We're really impatient. We're really impatient people. We could be incredibly impatient and we'll try even harder to control time. We act as if we can control time by, by cramming more stuff into our calendars, by erasing margins, by, by, by hoping that we can somehow like shape shift time itself. Many of us get caught saying, if I only had more hours in the day, busy is a badge. For some reason, we feel better about ourselves when someone asks us how we're doing and our answer is busy. It's like, a, it's like a badge of honor to, to be overwhelmed with so many things going on. And then we become obsessed with speeding things up and making things go more quickly. We have a 10-year-old boy at home, and he loves life hacks. He loves them. Like, life hacks. These are amazing. And, and he's always showing us different life hacks. And I'm like, dude, that one was actually pretty good. Thanks for showing us that one. But every life hack is meant to help you speed time up or, or get more time back or make something go more efficiently. In life, you win if you get there first. Yet, I love this reminder that Tish gives us in this book. She says, Christians are people who wait. We live in liminal time, in the already and not yet. Christ has come, and he will come again. We dwell in the meantime. We wait. But in my daily life, I've developed habits of impatience, of speeding ahead, of trying to squeeze more time into my cluttered day. How can I live as one who watches and waits for the coming kingdom when I can barely wait for the water to boil. In the meantime. I love the like, whoever made that word knew what they were doing because in the meantime is like the meanest thing we can experience, right? Like in the meantime is the absolute worst. It's offensive and most of the time it seems unnecessary. The meantime. Yet in the scriptures, we find the invitation over and over and over again for us to embrace the wait. James 5, 7, it says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient And stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Now, this invitation that we find throughout all of the scriptures, if you're like me, you turn the page. It's like, I don't have time to even dwell on what it might mean to wait. And, And we'll find ourselves trying to find these life hacks. So, you know, I already know in your head right now, you're like, if I know that I could be okay with waiting in traffic if I leave early enough. And that's a free life hack I'm going to give you this morning. That one's actually true. Early's on time, on time is late. And if you leave early, so we know this in the fire department. You cannot make up time on the road. You can't make up time. Mark just looked at me with a, with a grin. You can't. Like, we know this factually. In the fire department, it's all about shoot time. If you want to be first into that fire when the bell goes off, whoever gets on the rig the quickest and gets out the door the fastest gets to the fire first. You, no matter how fast you drive or how quickly you try to get there, you cannot make up time on the road. Now, while that's true and that one's free for you this morning, it's still you and me trying to figure out how to get around the weight to overlook, and, you know, you think, like, this is old stuff. Like, we're more sophisticated now. We have microwaves. We have, we have other ways to get around some things. But we have this choice daily. Are we going to embrace the weight, or are we going to try to find a way around it? 
And I think sitting in traffic, it can either infuriate us, fill in the blank, whatever that weight looks like for you. Maybe it's not traffic. But it can either infuriate us and, and we can squirm in our seats and we could pound our, our fists in a fit. Or we can take a deep breath and we can activate our patience as we embrace the weight as we sit. Tish, Tish says this. She says, I judge people who honk in traffic. Anybody honk in traffic? Confession. That was last week's. Okay, Tom, I see you. Anyone else? This is an easy one. Anyone ever just honk? You guys are too nice. So I, I, I serve as a fire captain, and I sit in the front right passenger seat, and the engineer does the driving, and on good days, all the noise making. But I also have noise making buttons at my feet. And I rarely step on that horn because I like my engineer to do all that, but every once in a while, my foot just slips onto that air horn and it goes on for a long, long time. She says this, she says, I judge people who honk in traffic, but if my feelings made sounds, they'd be honking too. I am just as impatient. I live in an instant world where I like to think I'm the captain of the clock. I live with the illusion that time, my time at least, is something I control. I'm not a farmer. I don't have to wait for the harvest or for the weather to change. I'm not a midwife. I don't have to wait for babies to come. When my computer moves too slowly, seconds really, I murmur, this is taking forever. Have you found yourself there? How can we begin to change the way we relate with the weight? How can we change the way we relate with time itself? We can can look at ordinary, mundane moments as as opportunities to reposture our hearts and our minds on things that are above. What if these really infuriating, frustrating things that we experience on the regular can regularly posture us in a different direction? What if they could actually move us out of our self-pity and move us into a posture where we can recognize and realize that the God of the universe is actually the captain of the clock? That we have really no control over many of these things. These moments, they they can become triggers or nudges or reminders that that waiting is to be experienced instead of rejected. This is the reality. This is the story. This is what God is trying to tell us over and over again in the scriptures. You are going to have to wait. You're just going to have to. And you can either leverage it as a way to see the goodness and the fullness of who I am, or you can use it to throw your sucker in the sand and feel bad for yourself. (laughs) Waiting could cause anticipation and excitement instead of frustration and exhaustion. You ever think about that? Like, when you're waiting, it's because you're hoping There's something you're looking forward to. If you weren't, you wouldn't care about how long it took to get there. So waiting can in and itself be filled and riddled with anticipation and hope. It could be about us looking forward to that of which is to come. Even if it's just closure or an answer. Perhaps the, the better we get at waiting the better we'll get at savoring, appreciating that thing that comes in its right time. Here's a life hack. The longer you wait, the more you'll appreciate. Like the longer you wait, the more you'll appreciate that thing when it comes, that that thing that's out there in the future. But Tish says it like this. But in my life, just her, I'm sure, time is most often something I seek to manage or something I resent. 
Something it seems that I never have enough of. In my frenetic life, I forget how to slow down and wait. For the good of my own soul, I need to feel what it's like to wait. To let the moments march past. And here I am, plunged into an ancient spiritual practice in the middle of a freeway. Forced against my will to practice waiting. Like, what if the next time you were in line, the next time you were waiting for that call or that answer or that thing, or you're literally locked in, sitting on the freeway, what if we began to see that as an opportunity to step into an ancient spiritual practice? As God is inviting us, he's inviting us to experience in the fullness what happens when we wait. I know that there's implications. And if you're like me, you're going, you don't get it, dude. If I'm late, I'm late. If I'm late, it's the job, it's the thing, it's the, I can't be late. So I have no time to wait. But there's this this story that she tells I want to read that really resonated deeply and and challenged me to be quite honest in a way that I've never experienced firsthand and I just want to share this this story with you she says I have a framed print above my bed of a painting by my friend Jan who has learned much about waiting through long and painful practice she has had recurring cancer and significant health problems that have given her scars and a hard won joy She's been shaped through waiting, waiting for a call from the doctor, for test results to come back, for another treatment, for healing, for she's not sure what. Her home is filled with her paintings, and one day, as I walked in, I was drawn to one in particular. It was an abstract, luminous and intricately textured, and there was a keyhole etched on the canvas. Standing before it, I felt like I was standing before an unearthly, mysterious door. I turned to Jan and I said, I want to see what's on the other side of the door. And she smiled and said, good. That's exactly how I wanted you to feel. The painting is called The Gift. She'd painted it during a time when, it was, when she was struggling to remain faithful as she waited and waited and waited. And she explained that she wanted the viewer to have the stretching sense of waiting, of not being able to glimpse what was on the other side, suspended in a posture of expectation and uncertainty. And she looked at me and said, I always felt like I was waiting for the gift, but I've come to see that waiting is the gift. What did that mean? For me, standing before that door was maddening. And yet Jan, who had practiced waiting for longer and better than I, knew what it was like to wait patiently, believing that God's timing is perfect, and that mysteriously there is more happening while we wait than just Waiting. In waiting, God has met Jan and sown in her things that only grew with time, with changing seasons and bated breath. I mean, is it even possible for us to stop waiting for the gift? And start seeing waiting as the gift. I know that many of you have suffered more greatly than I ever have. And many of you are further along in this place. And you probably have something to teach us as a community. But I also know that many of us have overlooked and, and, and tried to rush past these opportunities and these moments for God to grow something deep in us. For God to do something. And As I was pondering this idea, that's not a new idea, it's an old idea, something we challenge ourselves with a lot here at Makers, I thought about what if we 
didn't just find ways that we could practice this individually, but what would it look like for us as a church to shift collectively in this direction? I haven't even talked to Mark about this yet, so surprise. But I think one of the greatest gifts the church itself has given us is this thing called the liturgical calendar. It's a gift. It's something that we've dabbled in, that, that we've, we've practiced as a church from time to time incompletely. We've done Advent. We've done, we're, we're doing Lent. So this is us doing Lent right now. We started with Ash Wednesday, a reminder that, that in between the time from the ashes that we come from and the ashes we'll return to, that in between those two times is this thing called life riddled with the weight. And we're, we're practicing these spiritual disciplines week by week through this time of Lent. We're, we're trying to refresh ourselves and remind ourselves about some practices and some things that we can do that would connect us more greatly to God. But as a church, collectively, we've, we've just dabbled, and I think that there's something greater there for us that I would like for us to try as a church. And it's just this practice of the liturgical calendar in its completeness. Now, this cracked me up as I was feeling convicted about that, as I was praying, praying, praying over and, and preparing this message. I, I thought, um, of course, we're going to skew towards the fun stuff. Like Christmas is great. Lent is cool because it, it ends with this great thing called Easter. But, but baked into the liturgical calendar, between those great events, is this thing called ordinary time. Like that's literally the name of it in the church calendar. In between like the birth of Jesus and waiting for, waiting for the birth of Jesus and then the birth of Jesus and Epiphany, in between that and, and Lent, ordinary time. After Easter, or after Easter and then Pentecost, and then before we celebrate Advent again, ordinary time. Of course we skip that part with me helping shape what we do as a church. I don't want to celebrate ordinary time. That sounds boring. But like this gift has been curated and given to us as a church. We've been talking a lot about doing more and more like liturgical things congregationally. You've, you've probably experienced some of that in, in, in some different ways and some unique ways, and we want to do more and more of that. But what I don't want to overlook as a church is the ordinary time. In the meantime, it's a gift that's been given to us that we can practice corporately these these rituals and reminders, these rhythms that help us understand the full story of Jesus and the ministry that he began and the, the stuff that the saints did thereafter that. And it's something that we're being committed to more and more incrementally over, over time. And I really hope and I believe that as we practice these things together as a community, that we'll actually really begin to be shaped by the weight by the waiting, by the anticipation, by the preparing, by the looking forward to, so that we can savor the big things when they come. Following the liturgical calendar, it turns our focus to the bigger picture of life lived under the rule and reign of Christ. It, it slows us down and it gives us more intentional and eternal structure for our days and, and our years with God. And I think for me, like, I didn't grow up in a, in a liturgical church. Many of you didn't either. Some of you have. But even if you did, you can get so caught up in the religion and the, and the ritual and the routine of it that you don't even know the significance of it. And I think it'd be really beautiful for us to step into those opportunities in new, fresh ways that, that we can really learn together as a community. Uh, she says this in her book as she's talking about this. She says, practicing the liturgical calendar is a counterformation to a culture of impatience. It sets us apart as a peculiar people who resist what James K. A. Smith calls the incessant 24-7-ness of our frenetic commercial culture. 
This is an invitation for us to be reminded of individually and corporately that we as Jesus people, as Christians, we are waiting for the kingdom to come, yet we pray that prayer daily. Give us this day our daily bread. Would your kingdom come today on earth as it is in heaven, that we live in this liminal in-between space that is meant to be experienced in its fullness. We seek to bring a foretaste of that kingdom. It's active participation and waiting. We don't just wait around with sitting on our hands. We, we, we bring it about. We usher it in. Extending God's compassion and healing and brokenness all around us as we even sit and suffer with the least of these. Waiting actively and patiently for the fulfillment of his promise. Our hope for a future of shalom, it should motivate us to press toward that reality in the way we wait. God knows that in the waiting, we grow. We just spent a whole series talking about this growth metaphor. We spent a bunch of time talking about cultivate and, and all of this. And, and, and so this should be fresh on our minds if, if you've been here. But waiting is an exercise of hope. God is at work in the waiting. Tish says this in the book. God is at work in the waiting. Our waiting is active and purposeful. As dirt sits waiting for things to be planted and grown, there is work being done invisibly and silently. Microorganisms are breeding, moving, and eating. Wind and sun and fungi and insects are dancing a delicate dance that leavens the soil, making it richer and better, readying it for planting. That God is doing something in us in the waiting. I love the way Ecclesiastes 3 says this, what do workers gain from their toil? Have you ever felt like sometimes the hardest thing you do is wait? That's like, that's like toil for you? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Not our time, not your time, not my time, in its time. And this is the burden he laid on us. He has set eternity in the human heart. We have a, a longing and a taste for the reconciliation and the redemption of all things. And we are impatiently waiting for it. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. In the meantime, in the ordinary time, between the beginning and between the end, we can't fathom it. And because we can't understand it, we want to move past it. But I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live in the meantime. In the meantime, there's nothing better than to be happy while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. This is the gift. You ever think about that? That like those things that are just maintenance, eating, Drinking. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Going to the bathroom, all those bodily maintenance things. In the meantime, these things are the gift. They're to be savored and appreciated. And that you would find satisfaction in those things. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. That all of it, from the beginning to the end, there's a reason for it. None of it should be taken away. 
Tish says this, we live in a waiting world, a world where time itself, along with all of creation, groans in childbirth, waiting for something to be born. Here in traffic, when I'm stuck in the in-between, neither where I've come from nor where I'm going, I inhabit the liturgical rhythm I practice year after year, waiting and hoping. My present reality is fundamentally oriented toward what it is to come. I am on the way. So waiting, therefore, is an act of faith that is oriented towards the future. Yet our assurance of hope is rooted in the past, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth and his promises and resurrection. In this way, waiting like time itself centers on Christ, the fulcrum of time. So here's my challenge for you and for me this morning. The next time you find yourself waiting, I have a DMV appointment tomorrow. So this is for me. Next time you find yourself waiting, don't pull out your smartphone and distract yourself. Notice your thoughts, your emotions, and the surprise gifts that he can bring to you in those times when frustration or irritation arise, pay attention and invite God into that. Tish says this, sitting in traffic stuck is one of the very few times in my day where I embody the true state of my whole human existence on the way. Already, but not yet. Living as a creature in the in-between waiting. So I was thinking about why I drive in the slow lane. And I know what you were thinking this whole time. You're like, that dude's super spiritual. Like he just savors the slow lane and is just really contemplative and this real great like spiritual practitioner. I hope you're impressed. But it actually dawned on me, I drive in the slow lane not because of those things. I drive in the slow lane often because it's closer to the exit. I don't want to get jammed up over on the left number one lane when I had to get four lanes over to get out of this mess. So if you're smart like me, you'll drive closer to the exit. Because when the wait begins... If you're an idiot like me, you'll get off the freeway and try to find your way around it, and it will end up taking you more time than had you just sat on the freeway. Because here's the truth. There's no way around the wait that God has for you. The only way is through it. The only way is through it. And so my prayer, my hope is that I would change the reason I drive in the slow lane. That it's not because it's closer to the exit, but because it's an invitation to take an ordinary, mundane thing and practice an ancient way of connecting with God as we invite him in to do what only he can do as we embrace the wait. Would you pray with me? God, we need your presence desperately, more than anything. And God, I think it's because we lack your actual presence so often that we never want to stay there a while because we haven't sensed it in a real profound way. God, I know that if I was driving on the freeway in your presence, I wouldn't want it to end either. But God, I believe that's the way you want to show up in our lives. For us to be made aware of your presence. God, you're all around. You are in the mundane, ordinary things of life. May we no longer miss you 
in those moments. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and souls to sense that you are here with us. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Let's stand and worship.